Welcome to our time with uh, at Return Ministries. We're looking at, again, the partial readings that actually you have already read on this one, and uh, it's not the next, next week coming up. Um, I didn't know when I would be speaking next for sure, so I prepared this one because it's sort of a favorite uh, one to focus, a uh, core rebellion, because it's got some interesting points in it that can affect all of us. So, Father, we just come today and we commit this teaching to you and we bless you and praise you and give you thanks that we can come together and hear your word and look at your word and do you speak to us. So, Lord, um, use this uh, teaching time for your glory and uh, we commit ourselves anew to you in the name of Yeshua, Hamashiach, our Savior and Lord. Amen and amen. Well, I want to look at uh, the, actually, I'm not going to be doing number 16 right at the beginning. I want to look at numbers 15, the last several verses. So if you have your Bibles and you have your outlines there, the, the outline is, well, I'm following it. And I really wanted just a moment because I wanted to take a look at the last verses um, from numbers 15. And in numbers 15, we actually see the remembrance of the Lord's commandments. This is in verse 37 to 41. So I'm just going to read Deuteronomy 15, sorry, Numbers, Numbers 15, verse 37 to 41. It says, again, the Lord spoke to Moses saying, speak to the children of Israel, tell them to make tassels on the corners of their garment throughout their generations and to put a blue thread in the tassels of the corners. And you shall have the tassel that you may look upon it and remember all the commandments of the Lord and do them, and that you may not follow the harlotry to which your own heart and your own desire eyes are inclined. And that you may remember and do all my commandments and be holy for your God. I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt to be your God. I am the Lord your God. Now the reason I want to just take a look at this is that they're in the wilderness. They're traveling around. God has a purpose and a plan. He's wanting to uh, take the Egypt out of the Israelites. And of course, they had the opportunity to go into the promised land. God promised them that he would take care of them. Don't worry about the giants. Don't worry about anything. But they didn't listen. Um, with the, the, the spies that came back, they listened to the ten and didn't listen to Joshua and Caleb. And so as a result, they didn't go into the promised land. So 11-day journey became 40 years. That's a long time um, in the desert, simply because they didn't listen to God, who already told them. He sent the spies in. That wasn't just to make a decision. It was just to go in and probably do some tactics and strategy and take a look at what it was like, what they were going to be confronting. But God already told them, it's yours. I'm giving it to you. And you go, oh, my goodness. So can I have you turn that line down just a wee bit? This might my nerd tone over there. I want to see light. Anyway, so let me just walk through a couple of thoughts there. Um, the placing of the tassels on their garments in verse 38. So the word, again, for tassels, does anyone want to take a guess what that word in Hebrew is? Zitzi, yeah. And uh, it says, uh, and tell them to make tassels on the corners of their garments throughout the generations. So that's like forever, if you will and a blue thread in the tassel on the corner. So now if you've seen that, now I've got a couple of pictures here. Uh, well, first I'll do the tassel. Actually in the Hebrew, when I was reading, it's, it's zidzi. Now we also, normally you will see it spelled uh, T-Z-I-T-Z-I-T -T -Z -I -T in, uh, when you're reading it. And very, very interesting, uh, the gematria of zidzi in the Hebrew is when they in the fullness is 600. You say, why is that special? So 600. Anybody realize where we're going here with 600? Six, six, six. No. 
No? Okay. Um, how many commandments are there? 613. So we have six there, 600. How do we get the extra 13? Well, let's take a look. Now, these are two different sets of zitzi, four of them. Notice how many threads are there, uh, including the blue ones There's that come down. You see the, uh, here you see, you know, I got my arrow. There's there's four threads actually, and they, but there's doubled over. So you have eight coming down. Two blues, six white. Okay, so that's eight in each tassel. How many knots are there? Five. Why would there be five knots, eight strands, with zitzi 600? Because it adds up to 613. And so that's why they do it. Now remember why they're doing this, okay? Uh, here's another one here. Uh, they, they come in, the blue is actually from a, a, a shell, a musk. Uh, it, it's from a, uh, in the Mediterranean. It, they disappeared for years and years. And then just uh, 10, 20 years ago, they came back. And uh, they were able to, uh, they brought them back into Israel. They found some. And that's where the purple or the blue, really not purple, it's blue. It's a blue dye. And they come in different shades. But that's why the one uh, thread, which is doubled, uh, was to be put through. And the blue is a sign for the heavens. The blue is also points to God. And then, of course, you've got uh, the, the, the commandments, the 613 rules. But the amazing thing about this is that the purpose of these tassels, they wore them, they were to wear them. Now, today, uh, many, many of the observant Jews, uh, in order to wear it, with, uh, because they don't have robes and stuff like that. Jesus would have had, had them probably, well, they, we have them on our prayer shawls. If you have a prayer shawl, they'll have the tassels. It was easy. Mm -hmm. If you have um, uh, some of the uh, clothes, um, certainly they would have had them on their robes and Jesus would have had, maybe it might have been around his neck uh, as well, like a prayer shawl type of idea. But today with pants and shirts and modern uh, dress, what they do is they have a, a little uh, shirt that goes on with the tassels on it. And uh, it's like an undershirt. It's like a, just a, a, and then they put their, their white shirt normally or another shirt over top of that. But that, the tassels will come out, uh, come out of that. Um, some, not really completely orthodox, but they would put them on their belt loops, you know. Uh, you'll see it. Uh, but the, the whole purpose of that is, and this is, you know, I have to admit, when I read this verse, um, there are many, uh, not many, there are some Christians who um, wear the zitzi on them uh, all the time. Now, when the, I remember when the, a couple of the Jewish people came over uh, a couple of years ago when I was first new here, and they were saying, why are they wearing those on their belt loops? Like, they're not Jews. Why are they wearing that? They thought it was really crazy. They thought it was, did not make sense. And for the verse here, it says, and you shall have the tassel that you, what, may look upon it. Okay. And then what are they supposed to do when they look on it? So every time they see their zitzi, Remember all the commandments of the Lord. That's all the commandments of the Lord. And I guess that's for the Jewish people seeing Gentiles wear it and saying, are you obeying all the commandments of the Lord? You know, we know that that's what they're about. And do them. <laughs> and that you may follow, the, not follow, not follow the harlotry to which your own heart and your own eyes are inclined and that you may remember and do all my commandments. So that's really what it's about. So whenever you see uh, the ones with their tassels on, they have them in different forms sometimes. Like I have them on my prayer shawl, and I haven't got a blue one through. You have to get the, uh, to, to be kosher, a rabbi that is assigned to tying the knots in special ways. And the Ashkenazi have a different traditions on how to tie the knots. and even the numbers of knots and everything else. 
and as well as as the um, uh, what's the other Ashkenazi and the Sephardic, and so as a result, uh, it, it it is different. But and they have all their own rules and their own laws, which is uh, normal. But the priority of the relationship of the Lord, I think, is the most important of all. And in verse forty to forty one, it says to be holy for your God. So there will be holy. And we think of holy as as only pure and 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 and, and holy is like doing nothing wrong but holy means that but it also means to be separate to be set apart from uh, whatever the purpose is so god is saying to the jews you are set apart you're yes you're be called to live a holy life but you're set apart to be different from the nations and so he's done that and then he says i am the lord your god this can continues on in Leviticus, that phrase, and it's also in Numbers, I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt to be your God. And then he says, he repeats it, I am the Lord your God. And Lord is the word for Yahweh, it's a tetragrammaton, okay? So we have it here, is that that's the reason. So this sets up the story of Korah. He's telling them right from the get-go that, look, you're to obey all my commandments, and I am the Lord your God. I am your only God. And then we go into Numbers 16. So let's go on. And uh, in the, the consequences of, of Korah's rebellion is very great. That's what we're going to see in the verses 1 to 50. And what we happen, I'm going to put down different titles here, different segments. We're going to take it. The first segment, <coughs> excuse me, is the rising up of key leaders. In verses 1 to 3, it says, Now Korah, the son of Itzar, and son of Korah, the son of Levi, with Dathan and Abiram, the sons of Eliab, and On, the son of Pilath, sons of Reuben, took men, and they rose up before Moses with some of the children of Israel, 250 leaders of the congregation, representatives of the congregation, men of renown. They gathered them together against Moses and Aaron and said to them, you take too much upon yourselves for all the congregation is holy, every one of them. And the Lord is among them. Why do you exalt yourselves above the assembly of the Lord? Now, Right away, we see, wow, that is a, a major problem. So the men who rose against uh, Moses, actually, it, in verse 1, you might not pick up on this. We'll come back to this at the very end. But when we look at Korah, who led the rebellion with others who joined in with him, Korah was a cousin of Moses. This is an in-family fight that's going on. And there's jealousy and power struggles. Now, do we see that in the church today at all? Jealousy and power struggles. I, I can tell you of several in London right now that are happening. And it is ugly and it is not good. I have been a pastor for 27 years, and I've gone through two church splits, and both of them were power and jealousy. It was just amazing to watch godly men and women act like demons, you know? And this is what's happening here as well. So it's nothing new what we're seeing, but we have not learned the lesson from what we're supposed to, because all these are supposed to be examples, Paul says in 1 Corinthians, these are examples for us to follow. So the men who rose up, and again, we look at uh, verse 1 and 2, and it talks about Korah, who is the son of Itzar. And, uh, and, and, he, and he's from, the, from Levi, so he's from the same family as Moses. And um, as a result of that, they are the ones who, who uh, led this way. And they rose up before Moses with some of the children of Israel. And there, how many were there? 250 leaders of the congregation. And then 
in this passage, it says representatives of the congregation, just to let us know that they had the endorsement of the people. And this is really the strong thing. I've seen this in church uh, splits, is people will rise up and they'll gather groups in the congregation so that the congregation will come against the pastor or come against one of the leaders. And it's really ugly to watch this thing happen. And, uh, but th th then it adds here, they were men of renown. They were not just ordinary people. They were men of renown. Now, one of the church splits I had, my leadership took, they, they wanted, they, they thought I had too much influence and too much power. And they just came against me. And like, I finally drew the line when they said I wasn't allowed to open the mail. And the mail that came in, only the secretary could open it up and then distribute it and do the different ones. I could not open it, nor even get it from the post office. Like, I mean, it was just, I, this is just power. Or just, I just said, enough's enough. Like, come on. And so let's let the people decide. Now, the people did decide because they hadn't had a chance to, uh, to set that up. But another hand is uh, that... I've been in another church but where I was away, and sure enough, there was uh, for a month, and one person led the, started groups and started having meetings and wrote all kinds of stuff, and it was like all lies, but the, the church was split, and it was ugly. It was really, really horrible, and the church was doing really super well. Really, it was exploding spiritually financially everything and like it was like wow you would not expect it but that happens and and again we're going to see from Moses that Moses is amazing and he's a good example but the message that they gave to Moses and Aaron that's the really it was in verse three um, they gathered together against him and said you take too much upon yourselves did you catch that what do you mean you take too much upon yourselves like it's jealousy, you know, they, 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 they wanted more leadership and Korah wanted really to have Eliezer's position, it would appear. But anyhow, they're coming against Moses and Aaron. Aaron's a high priest, Moses is the leader. Moses talked to God, you know, uh, regularly. He was a friend of God. And, and then he says, for all the congregation is holy. Every one of them, the Lord is among them. Now, what are they saying? Now, I've seen this happen as well, is when the congregation says, we run the church. You are no holier than us. You, we have the same presence and power as you do. You are our paid leader to be head of the church. And I've seen that, and it's just, no, it is true. We're all, no one is holier than others. But we have our positions, and part of that position is to take in Moses. He was the one that went into the tabernacle. He was the one that spoke to the Lord. He was the one that gave the directions from the Lord. He was the one that went up to the mountain to talk to the Lord. They didn't want to even go up there because they didn't want to be, they didn't see themselves as holy. But now suddenly they are holy. And they, now they, they're saying, you're no holier than us. And, and then he says, why do you exalt yourselves above the assembly of the Lord? And I'm going, what? <laughs> Moses was the most humble man on the earth, is what Bible says. And they're saying, you exalt yourself. And these are the kind of accusations. Now, for a leader, it's very hard. You know, when a, somebody comes up and says, you are uh, a, a, a manipulator. Well, well, give me an example. Well, you just are. Everybody knows it. Well, come on. Or they'll say, uh, uh, you, 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 you just, when you walk around it, you, you just, you, you exalt yourself. And I go, well, give me an example. When do I do that? And I've had that happen, you know. And I'm going, well, just show me. Just tell me where. Well, everybody sees it. I said, well, who's everybody? Well, and then give me a name. Give me some other name. No, I can't tell you the name because, you know, I really, I want, so you're just gossiping right now. And I said, but show me and I will repent if I certainly am convicted of it. And if you, I, but I need to know, how do I change if I don't know how to change? You're saying, I just am, but I'm saying, show me how I am. 
So that's the kind of thing that happens sometimes. And, uh, you know, the Lord does vindicate, by the way, uh, the examples I'm giving, the Lord totally vindicated the situations that I was in, but I had to go through the lesson that Moses had to go through as well, is to leave it to the Lord to decide in the end. Because the more you defend yourself, the worse you look. <laughs> As soon as you start defending yourself, they say, oh, you really are guilty because you have to defend yourself, right? And so um, I, I praise the Lord, you know, when you go through you know, the churches where there is none of that, you go, oh, it is so good to see it. And I've been in churches there where there's just no, they, they, you know, the leadership is in place, the leadership is in u unity, the people understand the, the position, they understand how things work. And they love it when the pastor is leading and, uh, and, and, and the glory of God is moving and all those kind of things. Now, the response of Moses in verses 4 to 11. So let's just read 4 to 11. So when Moses heard it, he fell on his face. And he spoke to Korah and all the company saying, Tomorrow morning the Lord will show who is his and who is holy. <laughs> and will cause him to come near to him. That one whom he chooses, he will cause to come near to him. Do this. Take censers, Korah and all of your company, put fire in them, and put incense in them before the Lord tomorrow. And it shall be that the man whom the Lord chooses is the Holy One. You take too much upon yourselves, you sons of Levi. Then Moses said to Korah, Hear now, you sons of Levi, is, is, is it a small thing to you that the Lord God of Israel has separated you from the congregation of Israel to bring you near to himself, to do the work of the tabernacle of the Lord, to stand before the congregation and serve them, and that he has brought you near to himself, you and all your brethren, the sons of Levi with you, and are you seeking the priesthood also? Therefore, you and all your company are gathered together against the Lord. And what is Aaron that you complain against him? Oh, my goodness. So, uh, so but the, Moses, Moses it, again, he fell on his face. Now, the normal reaction sometimes is to get mad and angry and to swear, curse, or whatever, and to lose your temper. And, uh, but Moses fell on his face and prayed. Yeah. Well, when you fall on your face, normally that's, <laughs> your, that's, that's when you pray. And uh, we'll see that he actually does uh, intercede in, 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 the thing, in the future here. But, but he also made, he said, the choice that belongs to the Lord. He says, Moses spoke to Korah and all his company saying, tomorrow morning, guess what? The Lord will show who he is his and who is holy and will cause him to come near. So, again, it's a setup. He's just saying God's going to do it. And then he went on to say, that one whom he chooses, he will cause to come near to him. So, again, setting it up so that Korah and all the others will know that it's God who has chose Moses, God who has chose Aaron, God who's chosen the leadership. And uh, they're trying to decide that they should have the leadership. They deserve that right. Uh, he, he's going to, that's going to be confronted. Um, and then, of course, the censors will reveal the Lord's will. Now, this is very, very interesting because it says uh, in verse um, 6 and 7, do this, take censors. Now, does anybody know what censors, core in your company, put fire in them, put incense in them before the uh, uh, Lord tomorrow? Does anybody know what the censers look like at all? No, in the Catholic Church, uh, when I uh, they have censers, you know, they're on chains and a little thing, and you put the uh, coals in it, and then you put the sprinkle the incense on it, and you uh, you chain it with a chain. You just yeah, and and that well, that's that the Catholic Church's uh, thing, but that's not the way it was in Israel. Oh, okay. You you've got it. Melva's got it, and it's not actually necessarily long, but it is, a, you'll see it in a minute, I have a picture, and it shall be that that man whom the Lord chooses to the Holy One. And so, um, oh, it's coming up. I'll show you the censor, the censor in a minute. 
Now the complaint was against the Lord himself. That was the amazing thing. They complained against Moses and Aaron, but what they don't understand is that complaint is really against the Lord. They miss that. Because he appointed them, yeah. And a lot of times when these things that happen in churches as well, the people don't understand that lead these groups that rise up and try to take uh, power. And I know one of the churches in London just recently, I mean, while he was on holiday, they just ousted their senior pastor. And he was on holidays and found out that he could not come back. His office was cleaned out and uh, he'd have to pick up his stuff. And he was finished and he said, why? And no reason, they just, they, the leadership was in je jealous over his influence and his power. He was a great preacher. And as a result, he was just without a job. Well, it, it split the church and it, it made it just right into the people left. And it was a horrible thing. They're, they're, they're a church of a thousand people. It's not a small church. So like, you know, you go, wow. Uh, it, it, but, but they didn't understand that their complaint is against the Lord. It's not against the leadership. And um, anyway, um, matter of fact, it says in Numbers 16, 11a, first part of it, therefore you and all your company are gathered together against the Lord. So Moses makes that very, very plain to them. That when you, and, and I just want, just want to say that even when, you know, when we complain about things, we have to be very, very careful. By the way, complaining in again and again in the Old Testament meets with all kinds of bad things. I mean, sometimes fiery snakes come out and sometimes fire comes out of the ground. Sometimes holes open up, you're going to see in this story. Sometimes uh, plagues happen. Uh, I mean, complaining is not good. <laughs> Okay, and of course it says in the New Testament, what? Do all things without grumbling and, and, and fighting and, and dispute. So grumbling, complaining, murmuring is not good. Do all things without it. And uh, this is if you do that, you will shine as a light in a dark world. That's what it says in uh, Philippians. So it's very, very important we understand that next time you find yourself, and I've said this before, the next time you find yourself complaining, mm -hmm. just stop it for a minute and think about, for number one, it is a sin. Okay. Number two, you may be complaining against God when you're supposed, especially you're speaking against a person who is in an appointed position. Now, it's one thing to say, well, you might even be, you know, people complain about the weather all the time. <laughs> You, can, you might be complaining against God. I just, I said, you know, because he, he certainly controls the weather. Okay. And uh, what, so just be careful when you're complaining because uh, uh, there are consequences to it. And so, you know, wouldn't it be amazing if we could have a ministry like Return or a ministry or like a church that nobody complained? No complaints whatsoever. Wasn't it amazing? Everybody spoke positive and only situations of things that would elevate you know, the situation. Wouldn't it? Well, anyway, their conflict involved Aaron, which was amazing because Aaron was definitely appointed to be the high priest. His, he it was by God. I mean, it was, and, and, and what is Aaron that you complained against him? Like, why would you want the priesthood when that was given to Aaron specifically by the Lord? On the uh, on Mount Sinai, and so again, you can see the depth of this complaint. Jealousy does a horrible thing. Now, the resistance of the sons of Eliab, and going on from verse twelve, and Moses sent to call Dathan and Abiram, sons of Eliab, but they said, "We will not come up." <laughs> Is it a small thing that you have brought us out of a land of flowing with milk and honey to kill us in the wilderness that you should keep acting like a prince over us? Moreover, you have not brought us into a land flowing with milk and honey, nor given us inheritance of fields and vineyards. Will you put out the eyes of these men? We will not come up. So 
you, you, you think, don't you understand? You came out of Egypt. You were slaves for 430 years. You were under cruel taskmasters. It was affliction of the highest kind. And now you're complaining because, yes, you had a promise of going into a land of milk and honey, but you blew it. And now you're having to pay the consequences. He's going to take us there. He's promised that. Says they didn't tell him how long, how long it was going to be. But now they're saying, you know, why would you kill us in the wilderness? Well, God was the pillar of cloud by day, pillar of fire at night. He kept them shady in the day and warm at night. He fed the manna. He gave them quail. He gave them water. And he's there to kill them. Ah, after all you've seen going through the Red Sea. Anyway, uh, and then in verse 15, then Moses was very angry and said to the Lord, do not respect their offering. I have not taken one donkey from them, nor will I hurt one of them. And Moses said to Korah, tomorrow you and all your company be present before the Lord, you and they, as well as Aaron. Let each, let each take his censer and put incense in it, and each of you bring his censer before the Lord. 250 censers, both you and Aaron, each with his censer. So every man took his censer, put fire in it, laid incense in, on it, and stood at the door of the tabernacle of meeting with Moses and Aaron. And Korah gathered all the congregation against him at the door of the tabernacle of meeting, then the glory of the Lord appeared to the congregation. Wow. So let's just walk through that. So it was Dathan and Abiram, the sons of Eliab, again connected uh, to uh, the uh, Moses. He wasn't a direct, I don't believe they were cousins. Korah was a cousin of, uh, of uh, Moses. Um, but when they were, they were, in alignment with Korah. That's what happens is people come into alignment in these kind of situations because of the influence. And we're going to find out Korah was extremely wealthy from the, we read in the um, uh, Talmud, very influential, very powerful. But uh, the, the, uh, the friend, uh, sons of Eliab, they refused to come when they called. And so they said, no, we're not going. And, um, and then in verse 15 to 18, they actually react to it. And um, uh, uh, we see that the Lord <clears throat> reveals his glory by when they came with their censers, the glory of the Lord appeared to all the congregation. We see that in verses 19 to 22. So Korah gathered all the congregation against him, the door of the tabernacle of meeting, and then the glory of the Lord appeared to them. And uh, did I have a picture of that? No, I will. Uh, <clears throat> this is now the realization of who is right. So we're going to see now in, um, uh, in verses 23 onward, we're going to see, uh, let's see, 23. Well, let's read from 20. And... Um, and the Lord spoke to, Mo, verses 20, verse 20, the Lord spoke to Moses and Aaron saying, separate yourselves from the congregation that I may consume them in a moment. Then they fell on their faces and said, O God, O the God of the spirits of all flesh, shall one man sin and you be angry with all the congregation. So here is intercession by Moses, right? So the Lord spoke to Moses saying, Speak to the congregation, saying, Get away from the tents of Korah, Dathan, and Abiram. Then Moses rose and went to Dathan and Abiram, and the elders of Israel followed him. And he spoke to the congregation, saying, Depart now from the tents of these wicked men. Touch nothing of theirs, lest you be consumed in their sins. So they got away from around the tents of Korah, Dathan, and Abiram. And Dathan and Abiram came out and stood at the door of their tents with their wives, their sons, and their children. Um, keep going. Moses said, By this you shall know that the Lord has sent me to do all these works, for I have not done them of my own will. 
If these men die naturally, like all men, or if they are visited by the common fate of all men, then the Lord has not sent me. But if the Lord creates a new thing, and the earth opens its mouth and swallows them up with all that belongs to them, and they go down alive into the pit, then you will understand that these men have rejected the Lord. Wow, that's amazing revelation. And so um, first we see the separation. They separate Korah, Dathan, and Byram, and just so that God's about to do some amazing thing. And the sentence of Moses is that, you know, that um, he's going to do, you're going to know that uh, I've not done this of my own will. Um, it, it was not my decision, it says in verse 28, uh, and it's not going to be a normal death. You're going to see something that you will know, that God is in this. God is doing what he said he would do. God is taking care of the situation. And it must be a disaster that would prove the point. So in verse 30, it will be a new thing, and the mouth will, of the ground is going to open up. Now, I just imagine pictured. I don't know. Did, did I put somewhere? I put a picture in here. It'll come in a minute. But the revelation of, of the Lord's power in verse 31 to 35 is amazing. It says, Now it came to pass, as he finished speaking these words, all these words, that the ground split apart under them, and the earth opened its mouth and swallowed them up with their household and all the men of Korah, with all their goods. So they and all those with them went down alive into the pit. The earth closed over them, and they perished from among the assembly. Then all of Israel who were around them fled at their cry, for they said, lest the earth swallow us up also. And a fire came out of the Lord and consumed the 250 men who were offering incense. So they got the leaders offering these incense. They've got the Korah with his group. And of course, what happens there, um, the prophecy is immediately fulfilled. Uh, as the ground opens up. And we can, here's a picture, uh, not a photograph. Um, but you can see Moses there. And so he has separated himself from Korah and his group. And I, I don't, I, I'm trying to find a picture of, of the ones that had the censors, the, uh, the ones that had the leaders from each of the group. Um, how many were there again? Um, 250, yeah. And, uh, and a fire came out because you had 250 men who were offering incense. So, wow, uh, it was amazing. And it, but panicked went through all of Israel. Could you imagine when you see the ground opening and then suddenly people disappearing and then the Lord sending fire down to all the ones who have incense and uh, the punishment of the 250 in verse 35, um, they were consumed. And so, um, hmm, I, I did have another picture here somewhere, but the remembrance of this rebellion in verse 36 to 40, it says, then the Lord spoke to Moses saying, tell Eleazar, the son of Aaron, the priest, to pick up the, incense, the censers out of the blaze, for they are holy and scatter the fire some distance away. Now, this is an amazing part that we often miss. He said, pick up the censers. Now, they're made of bronze or uh, they call called brazen. Um, and it says, the censers of these men who sin against their own souls, let them be made into hammered plates as a covering for the altar. Because they presented them before the Lord, therefore they are holy, and they shall be a sign to the children of Israel. So Eleazar the priest took the bronze censers for which they were burned up, and had present, uh, which, which those who were burned up had presented, and they were hammered out as a covering on the altar to be a memorial to the children of Israel that no outsider who is not a descendant of Aaron should come near to offer incense before the Lord that he might not become like Korah and his companions 
just as the Lord had said to him through Moses. So it, what we're seeing here is God is doing something to help the people remember. And I think it also help us remember. And he actually says in uh, verse 38, the second part, and it shall be a sign to the children of Israel. And so not only the remembrance that we did to Korah, but he also now, he, the censors were taken out of the fire. And this is amazing to me. You're, what you're going to see is he's going to take the censors made of bronze and he's going to use them and hammer it out to do what? So the censors? Yeah. Sinned against it. Let them be hammered plates as a covering for the altar. So up to this time, the altar where the sacrifices were done in the tabernacle, okay, was not covered with bronze. But from this time on, and now we, you will refer to, when you read about it later, the bronze altar, the bronze uh, altar of offering. And it was covered with the censers from this rebellion so that the people would always remember when they see and they, uh, the priests, certainly, people didn't get in there, but the priests would go in. The one, they would see the bronze altar. People would hear about the bronze altar, and they would remember this is a sign of what happened. We need to remember and not follow the way of Korah and the ones that sided with Korah. And so from that time on, all the offerings that were raised up to the Lord as an offering were on the plate of the of rebellion isn't that amazing and I, I find it also amazing when you hear other you know there's so many imagery when the another one where the uh had the bronze serpent was put up and the plague went on and the way they stopped the plague was that the the on the pole the serpent and anybody who looked on it stopped then Jesus, when he comes, he says, he, he, he'll be lifted up on a, a pole on the cross, and, and all who look on him will be saved. And so he uses that imagery in the same way. You know, the, the serpents went out and they, they attacked the, the people, and then they took the serpent, a bronze serpent, put it up, and now it becomes the symbol of our medical profession. And in actual fact, they have a double serpent on it, and it's really not a single serpent would be, should have been the symbol for a physician. A double serpent is uh, for trade. It's a symbol for trade. But anyway, it gets lost in the translation. So we see the, the serpent up on, in the, in the symbol for the doctors and uh, the profession, the physicians. And, uh, but anyway, and so it says that, so Eliezer took uh, the bronze uh, uh, censers and burned up and presented them. They were hammered out as a covering for the altar. So I just find that very, very amazing. And the commandment was, uh, that was repeated in verse 40, and it's to be a memorial to the children that no outsider who is not a descendant of Aaron should come near to offer incense before the Lord. That they might not become like Korah and his companions, just as the Lord had said to him through Moses. Now, um, the results of the plague, again, in verse 41 to 50. Um, now, this is amazing. After all of this happened, uh, I mean, I still, when I was reading this and I was going through different commentaries and trying to figure this out, like for myself, if I would have seen that, uh, and I was one of the people, like, I think I would have said, hmm, <laughs> we really need to respect Moses and Aaron, and we really need to learn this lesson about complaining. And then look at this. On the next day, all the congregation, all, it says all the congregation of the children of Israel complained against Moses and Aaron, saying, you've killed the people of the Lord. Though they had a lot of influence, obviously, right? Now it happened when the congregation had gathered against Moses and Aaron that they turned toward the tabernacle of meeting and suddenly the cloud covered it and the glory of the Lord appeared. God comes again. and He's now at this time, his glory is coming over the tabernacle. Then Moses and Aaron came before the tabernacle of meeting 
And the Lord spoke to Moses saying, get away from this congregation. I may consume them in a moment. <laughs> and they fell on their faces. Now, I believe that's Moses and Aaron fell on their face. And so Moses uh, uh, said to Aaron, quick, you know, uh, I'm putting quick in there. Take a censer and put fire in it from the altar and put incense on it and take it quickly to the congregation and make atonement for them. For the wrath has gone out from the Lord. The plague has begun. Then Aaron took it as Moses commanded and ran into the midst of the assembly. And already the plague had begun among the people. So he put in the incense, made atonement for the people, and he stood between the dead and the living. So the plague was stopped. Now those who died in the plague were 14,700, besides those who died in the Korah incident. So Aaron returned to Moses at the door of the tabernacle uh, meeting where the plague had stopped. So just quickly uh, finishing up here, the, the murmuring of the people, we see that. <laughs> it, it's just unbelievable how, but you know, um, I, I shouldn't be really surprised because, you know, even in, and, I, and I'm not speaking against churches at all. I, there are some churches that are so wonderful and beautiful and absolutely godly, but I see other churches where, they do not learn their lessons and like almost all churches that split will split again matter of fact the high i think they say 80 to 90 percent if you have a church split it will split again because people don't learn the lessons and they keep doing the same thing over again and then some churches it will have split two three four times one of the churches in london i think it's split at least five times since i've been there four times and it won't like they have not learned. And these, this, these are evangelical churches. These are preaching Jesus. And they just have not learned the lessons with regard to their complaining and what they want and the power. And, you know, they always, it's, it, it's not, if it's a worship, they don't like the worship. They don't like the preacher. They don't like the people leading. They don't like this. They don't like that. And one day they didn't like the building. And so they moved out into another building altogether and left a whole bunch behind and took a I mean, it was just crazy but anyway uh it, it, it's amazing to watch these things happen um and here they are complaining against that uh, i don't know if they this one here's got uh, torches and that i know they wasn't probably at night but they are complaining against moses and aaron very very upset and uh we see them this is on the next day the congregation um and it's on the very next day, all the congregation of the children of Israel complained against Moses and Aaron. That's when I can't, can't get my head around all the congregation. <laughs> and it says, you have killed the people of the Lord? Did you see the Lord do it? Like, I don't get this, but they blame Moses. Again, you know, this blame shifting, it's amazing to watch that, how that happens. When people get angry and they get upset, they shift blame. By the way, and that's one of the things that happens, and I, you know, I've been through it as a pastor. When people get upset, they accuse you of things that are happening that you have nothing to do with. The things that you, you're going, that wasn't me. That means that was, I had nothing to do with that. But you get blamed for it, and you've done it. In, in this case, you know, said, you've killed the people of the Lord. When it was obvious that God did it. I mean, Moses <laughs> he just said he separated himself and God did it and told about what God was going to do. But anyway, uh, they blamed him. Um, the movement of the cloud, and, and I, I think I've had a picture here. Could you imagine when they're there and they're complaining, and suddenly the cloud moves and it goes right over the tabernacle and, and, and the glory of the Lord is shining. So something happened. It wasn't just a, a cloud at this point. Now the glory is showing. So now they're seeing the glory, okay? They know God has shown up. You'd think this would be a time for them to repent, yeah, but not necessarily. And it says, and, and suddenly the cloud covered it, and the glory of the Lord appeared. I love it. You see on there, uh, highlighted. The glory of the Lord appeared. And then Moses and Aaron came before the tabernacle of meeting. And then going on, uh, the message from the Lord in verse 44 and 45, 
And the Lord spoke to Moses said, get away from among this congregation that I may consume them in a moment. And again, Moses and Aaron interceded. They fell on their face. And Moses right away knew that something had to be done because he knew that God was angry. This time he doesn't intercede and just say, no, don't do it, Lord, or as he did in some other situations, and for your name's sake and, and for, the, the, for the people or whatever. This one he just told uh, Aaron, get out there, get a censer, and start to you. So he said well, to Aaron, take a censer, put fire in it from the altar, put incense on it, take it quickly to the congregation, and make atonement for them. So he said, take the censer, and you will be covering Atonement means covering, covering their sin. You're covering their complaint. But take the censer. Again, the censer is even for uh, in, in the church, when they use censers in the Catholic church, Anglican churches, but censers, and we'll see that in the uh, book of Revelation, incense, censers are used, are prayers of the saints. It's talking about prayers going up from the, the, the righteous. So he's saying, make atonement for them using the censer. So these are the prayers of covering of atonement. For wrath has gone out from the Lord, the plague has begun. And so here, here's a, a one of the censers you can see there in the bottom. Um, the censers were probably like that, I don't know. Some of them had longer uh, handles and uh, some of them had shorter handles, my understanding of it is. But they, they had the coals in the, it's like a shovel, really, eh? and that was the censer. So here's a picture of a, a depiction of Aaron going out amongst the people to stop the plague. And this, like he's going around, and it's with the prayers of intercession for the people, saying, Lord, spare them, spare them, have mercy on them. Now, people say there's no mercy in the Old Testament. I'm saying there's lots of mercy. <laughs> and here's one incident of mercy where he just stopped the plague through, even though they had sinned seriously. So, and then Aaron took it um, as Moses commanded, ran in the midst of the assembly. Already the plague had begun among the people. So he put it in the incense, made atonement for the people. Verse 47. And so we see the multitude that were killed in 49 and 50, it was, uh, now they who died in the plague were 14,700, besides those who died in the Korah incident. So it was Korah and the 250 with the incense. Uh, so there's a lot of people who died. And so Aaron returned to Moses at the door of the tabernacle meeting for the plague had stopped. Amen and amen. Now, um, I just want to do some summary points here. Just uh, We may have missed it, and then we're going to close, so just about five minutes more. But um, one of the things I want to get ready for you is we're going to go into number 17. Why? Because something you'll see that might be very different. But number one, the rebellion involved pride and jealousy from within a family. Um, very often, did Jesus talk about the fact that there would be division within families? When he said, yeah, you know, people will turn against one another in families when we come to him. Families will be separated. And yeah, some of you of us know about that. And so when you become a believer in Jesus, there'll be people in your family that may turn against you. There'll be people that will rise up and say things about you and they, they get upset at you because of what you believe or because of what you do and they don't agree with what you do and it's just absolutely amazing but when pride you remember the center letter of pride is i it's all about me i myself and uh pride comes in and jealousy jealousy is an ugly ugly thing that the spirit of jealousy Within churches, um, I, I do a special prayer. So sometimes when people, pastors ask for it, we do a shield of honor. The spirit of jealousy links up with other spirits and does damage in congregation. The spirit of jealousy is probably the greatest destruct, the destroyer in congregations. Jealousy is a horrible thing. 
And, and, and people get jealous. They're jealous of other people's position, jealous of why am I not there? Why are they up in front? Why do they get favored? I don't get favored. Why does the pastor mention them? Why does the pastor like them better than me? You know, all these kinds of is jealousy, you know. And, and even, uh, you know, I was, have had to deal with situations where, where sometimes, like in my situation, I mean, I'm up front, and they look, oh, wow, I wish I had a husband that really followed the Lord. I wish I had a husband that was submit, you know, that loved his wife, like Joe appears to love Vicky, you know. My husband doesn't do it. So they get jealous of the pastor or the leader that they look up to. That's very dangerous. It's extremely dangerous. So that jealousy from within family, and especially the family of God, is ugly, ugly, ugly. But the second thing is the rebellion caused Moses to resort to intercession. And so, amazingly, again, is that when we get into these situations, uh, we can turn against the people who are doing it, or we can end up in intercession. For myself, one of the things I learned is that I had to walk in integrity when you go through these situations, but you also have to become an intercessor. You have to become one that will stand and say, Lord, don't destroy them. They, they know not what they do. Just like Jesus on the cross. What did he say? Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. You have to be in that kind of a prayer. Even though you'd like to say, wipe them out, Lord. Just wipe them out. <laughs> Get rid of them. Start me over the nude group. <laughs> and, and, but, but no, you just say, oh, Lord, please, please forgive them. And, and, and one situation, I just had to walk away from it. It was just because it was just, it, it, it was not being resolved. You know, they weren't going to leave. And for the better of the church, it was best that I left with Vicki and, and her family. And, and, and uh, they, they eventually came back and asked for forgiveness years and years later. But it was, a, it, it was no sense in staying there and fighting. And it would just be a constant fight. So you, some, some, something has to be done. But again, intercession, standing and holding them before the Lord. And I lead intercessors, as you know. We pray for Canada. We pray for Israel. And when we do intercession, we do two things. I keep reminding the intercessors. That when you do intercession, you number one, you take a situation or a person and you bring them before the Lord to be reconciled to him. Okay? So it's like not take them to the Lord and teach them, Lord, and, you know, and hurt them, Lord. No, it's not like that. It's you say, Lord, I bring that person. I bring that situation. I, we do this for government. We bring the government before you. We know they're not following at all. Lord, reconcile them. Deal with them. Bring your love and mercy. Show them you reveal yourself be reconciled to you so that they can change, okay? But not, not get them, Lord, but we love them, Lord. We want them to follow you. We want righteousness in our nation, for example. The second thing is to stand against the enemy. So you're bringing to the Lord the standing against the enemy. Lord, that the enemy not have his way, that the enemy's plans and schemes not have their way. So intercession is very, very important. Moses shows this again and again. He stands in the gap praying for the people, and he's amazing, amazing in that way. Um, this rebellion shows the principle of vengeance is mine, says the Lord. And we read that, you know, that God, God, uh, it, it, God says he will do it. And, and when you see in Romans 12 that principle come through, he says, Beloved, do not avenge yourselves, but rather give place to wrath, uh, for it is written, vengeance is mine, I will repay. That's a key principle in when, when we come across people and situations is not to allow ourselves to react with anger, vengeance, revenge, any of those areas. And it says, says the Lord, therefore, if your enemy is hungry, uh, feed him. And if he's thirsty, give him a drink. For in so doing, you will heap coals of fire on his head. And of course, um, the, uh, that's from Proverbs, that uh, keep heaping coals on his head. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. That's the hardest thing of all. And when we get into situations against people, is to not be overcome by the evil, but overcome evil with good. 
and to see the fact that you're not fighting against flesh and blood. Um, you're, it's against powers and principalities, and rulers in high places. Deuteronomy 32 verse 35 also picks up on this vengeance one. And, and it says, vengeance is mine and recompense. In other words, vengeance is mine and I will deal with the results. I will deal with what it is. And then it says, their foot shall slip in due time for the day of their calamity is at hand and the things to come hasten upon them. So again, God is saying, I will take care of the situation. That is very, very difficult thing to do again. And we get into church splits, church fights, church problems, ministry problems as well. And it is to, to be able to step back and let the Lord deal with it and not... Uh, <laughs> not get angry and want to do it and do something yourself. That's very difficult. And the next thing is uh, the rebellion resulted in the Lord taking further action to show his choice of leadership. Now this part we, you would probably miss if you didn't read the next chapter. So Moses has dealt with this situation. The Lord's dealt with it through Moses and Aaron. Aaron's gone through. But I just wanted, I'm just going to read this next chapter and then we're going to stop. Okay, because God is going to again show the leaders throughout the congregation um, his desire for Aaron and his favor on Aaron, his the position he's given to Aaron. So listen to the, and we just, I'll end with this uh, reading. So, number 17. And the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Speak to the children of Israel and get from them a rod from each father's house all their leaders according to their father's houses houses 12 rods so 12 different rods from the different uh, 12 tribes write each man's name on his rod and you shall write Aaron's name on the rod of Levi for there you shall for there shall be one rod for the head of each father's house and then you shall place them in the tabernacle of meeting before the testimony, so this is in the Holy of Holies, eh? where I meet with you, and it shall be that the rod of the man whom I choose will blossom. Thus I will rid myself of the complaints of the children of Israel, which they make against you. So Moses spoke to the children of Israel, and each of their leaders gave him a rod apiece. Each leader, according to their father's house, 12 rods, and the rod of Aaron was among their rods. And Moses placed the rods before the Lord in the tabernacle of witness. That's the tabernacle of meeting. That's right in the Holy of Holies. Now it came to pass on the next day that Moses went into the tabernacle of witness. And behold, the rod of Aaron of the house of Levi had sprouted and put forth buds and produced blossoms and yielded ripe almonds. Then Moses brought out all the rods before the Lord to all the children of Israel, and they looked, and each man took his rod. And the Lord said to Moses, Bring Aaron's rod back before the testimony to be kept as a sign against the rebels, that you may put the complaints away from me, lest they die. Thus did Moses, just as the Lord commanded him, so he did. So the children of Israel spoke to Moses, saying, Surely we die, we perish, we all perish. Whoever even comes near the tabernacle of the Lord must die. Shall we all utterly die? They finally got the message. Now, I was going to say I was going to stop there. Let me make two more comments very quickly. Number one is the fact that um, what happened to Moses, or Aaron's rod. You remember where, where was it kept from that time on? In the yeah, in the ark of the, uh, the cell. So what was else out in the ark? Yeah, the jar of manna. The tabernacle, the ta tablets of the Ten Commandments. No, no, just just three things, and and the rod, three things, the rod, Aaron's rod, and now in the Talmud, very interestingly, it says that Aaron. That's not doesn't say that here. It says that Aaron's rod blossomed white blossoms. That's what it says in the Talmud. You say, what difference does that make? Well, 
because there are two kinds of almonds. Okay, there are sweet almonds, and they have white blossoms, and then they have bitter almonds that you can't eat, and they're not good for edible at all, and they have pink blossoms. And now if the Jewish rabbis say that pink is the color of deception. <laughs> and so they said Moses or Aaron, or Aaron's rod blossomed beautiful almonds. It had actually said it had fruit on them, right? There were actually almonds on it. It said not blossoms and almonds. It was sweet to eat. And they had white blossoms because you couldn't eat the, uh, the bitter ones. And for the rabbis, they go into a whole length of, you know, uh, our own lives of sweet and bitter and all those kinds of things and what we should produce. We all should be producing sweet. Uh, 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 and white is a sign of purity, so our lives are holy. And we produce almonds that can be feed others and be sweet in their all those kind of things. So it, it's beautiful teaching, uh, but not necessarily totally biblical, but it's beautiful based on this story. So uh, let me just close off and say, I there some good lessons that we can learn here. <laughs> oh my goodness. And hopefully that we do learn them and that we do apply them. So let me close in prayer. Father, we come today and we just bless you and thank you. And uh, thank you for this story. Lord, it, it, it's got so many astounding <laughs> um, implications, uh, even for ourselves. But Lord, thank you that you are God. Yes, you're a God of judgment, but you're also a God of mercy. And thank you that you uh, used Aaron and Moses to bring forth atonement, intercession. Thank you that intercession still works today, that you are calling for intercessors, people to pray. Thank you, Lord, that again, you said, um, you are the Lord, and you will always be Lord. And we're to always recognize you, that you are the Lord God. And we come before you, and thank you for Yeshua, Jesus. Thank you that you brought forth him to reveal yourself more to us, but also that, Lord, you can live inside of us, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, living within us, to change us and empower us to change. So, Lord, we commit this to you and commit these lessons to you. In Yeshua's name, amen and amen. And we'll stop recording.